this session of Think Tent. Uh, my name is Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, one of the two partners running all of these events in the marquee. And I'm delighted that you've been able to make it for this uh, very special occasion with a very special guest. Let me just tell you what the format's going to be. I'm going to be asking questions for about half an hour or so, and then I will take questions from the audience. And we're going to cover pretty much every topic under the sun by half past five, the world would have been put to rights, uh, trust me. Um, so, a word about our special guest this afternoon. Steve Baker has served as a Conservative MP for Wickham since 2010. He is currently chair of the COVID Recovery Group and a member of the Treasury Select Committee. Previously, of course, he was the chair of the European Research Group. He has described himself as a hard man of Brexit, but I think many others have described him as a hero of Brexit. Um, and he spent just over a year as the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for exiting the European Union in 2017 and 2018. He's a regular at the Institute of Economic Affairs, a very good friend of our think tank and a very good friend of freedom in general. Please give a very warm welcome indeed to Steve Baker MP. Thanks, Steve, great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you very much for having me on. So, uh, Steve, I, I um, wasn't able to attend the last session here in Think Tent run by our friends of the Taxpayers Alliance and the, the theme, the question of that session was are the Conservatives now the party of high tax and high spend? But I had to go off and do an interview on the same topic. I don't know what the conclusion was, but are they? Perhaps yeah, you can, you yeah, can yes, help me here. Yes, I'm afraid we have become that party. And in a sense, we're all socialists now, I'm sorry to say. And I don't see any point um, ducking the question when you look at the last 18 months we've had and you look at what we're doing. I think this is a time when we've got to rediscover what it means to be a Conservative. And actually, I think there's a huge appetite amongst members of the party and members of Parliament to do just that. And can I just say a huge thank you since I've got this moment. I really appreciate everybody coming. And to the people who've been kind as I've walked in, I'm just really grateful because I know I do occasionally take these uh, radical positions like we should be free market. But... Um, <laughs> But it means a lot to me to have your support, so thank you. Yeah. Well, I think it, it means a lot to us, Steve, to have uh, not just a, a politician who's interested in ideas, but a politician who's interested in our ideas, right? But talk me through, um, how do you think we got to this position? Uh, okay, the pandemic and the associated lockdown around it and the debts around it. Uh, okay, this is problematic, but it's worsened what was already an underlying position, right? Yeah. It's not as if we built up some massive sovereign wealth fund and have been tucking money away for a rainy day. It's 20 years since the government has run a surplus at budget time. That was under the Labour Party, by the way. All of the work of the early years of the coalition government to balance the books, that's totally out of the window. And the liabilities were even higher. And now I've heard different um, accounts of this, but I'm going to back the account of the Taxpayers' Alliance, uh, that taxes are now higher as a proportion of GDP or will be at the end of the Parliament than they were under Clement Attlee's post-war socialist government. But this has been death by a thousand cuts, don't you think? And that COVID-19 may have been more than one cut. Yep. But we've been heading in this direction for some time. At least 100 years. So there's an old saying that today is the tomorrow, which the bad economist yesterday told us to ignore. <laughs> and I'm afraid for 100 years plus years since 1911 National Insurance Act, we have been constantly transferring to the state responsibility for looking after people. And we've now reached the point where that is running onto the rocks. And the reason is, if you look, it's, it's age-related spending. And we've got to be realistic about this if we're going to grasp it. So if anyone here goes on and looks at uh, the OBR's fiscal sustain sustainability report, it just shows a whole bunch of charts going off, uh, disappearing off exponentially is a word that's been used too much, but just constantly growing. But what they really tell you is that sometime in my lifetime, the state is going to default on its debt obligations. And actually, the OBR was quite frank about that in 2018. They talked about debt levels of 250, 300%, and said, of course, this will never happen. Policy will need to change, something like that. That's a very glib way of saying the state is going to default on pensions and healthcare obligations. The problem with it is we need to do something now about it because it's a very long lever. So to your point about 
how long it's taken. It's, I think it goes back at least to the 1911 National Insurance Act and before that ideologically. But what the pandemic has done is it has crystallised this problem of debt by catapulting us forward about 25 years on the debt projection. Now, we can't be despairing or miserable or sad or whatever else about any of this. But if I may, if you ask yourself, was our present crisis caused by the state being too small, too limited, spending too little? Was it caused because we didn't borrow enough? Or because money was too sound, too tight, <laughs> interest rates were too high? Those questions all answer themselves, right? Everybody here knows that conservative economic policy is limited government, low taxes, balanced budgets, and sound money. And that's what we haven't had. And there's an enormous literature about all this stuff. Alan Greenspan, of all people, once wrote a famous essay which pointed out you have to have expansionary money to pay for the promises of the welfare state because you can't cover it in taxes. But the reason I'm willing to be really frank about this is because my constituency is not a very well-off constituency. Setting aside any challenge to the method, we've just been found the most food insecure place in the UK. And that is shaming and humiliating. And I want to do something about it. But from where we are, I want to ask all of you, does anyone here, maybe there's a Guardian journalist here, but does anyone here really think we're going to improve the lot of the poor from where we are today by taxing more, spending more, borrowing more, or printing more money? Of sure. course we're not. Show sure, hands. Anybody in favour of that proposition? <laughs> So One person in favour of that yeah. proposition. The audience is nearly as sound as the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I'm afraid it just it doesn't bear a moment's scrutiny. Uh, it doesn't bear a moment's scrutiny against the history of the world or, or, the, or the history of big economic facts. And it's going to come back and smack us around the back of the head unless we as a Conservative Party, and we're the only party who can do it, start delivering good quality Conservative government and making use of an 80-seat majority, which at the moment, I have to say, is being squandered. So I, I think I'm even more pessimistic than you are, Steve, if that's possible, because uh, uh, I agree with you that over uh, 100 years or so we've seen the inexorable growth of the state with, with certain periods of, of rollback, the, the Thatcher administration, for example. You, you know, the state gets out of the way in a number of areas. You know, the, uh, it's pointed out then, you know, the state ran a number of travel agencies and pubs even and some of the computer industry... Uh, quite a lot of things when the IEA came into existence that we were uh, discussing, arguing about. Uh, I can remember an early IEA pamphlet in the 1960s was, you know, might it be possible at some point in the future, perhaps, to have a non-nationalised telecoms industry? And of course, everybody said, that's bananas. I mean, every civilised country will have a nationalised telecoms industry. So there have been occasional pieces of, uh, of move in a market direction. But the reason I think it's now worse is it seems to me that you can choose to run a social democratic state which, say, taxes 40% of GDP and spends 40% of GDP. It might be, that might be too high a level for your and my preference, but the government doesn't go bust at that point. Our problem now is liabilities building up, that we're not making any trade-offs. Uh, I continually hear the argument, ah, oh, well, if you've got the money to spend on X then you must also have the money to spend on Y. No, it's a zero-sum game here. Yeah. So I think we've actually got liabilities that are making it impossible to raise the taxes necessary to meet the promises politicians have made. Uh, the promises which politicians have made over a very long period. Sure. Yeah, right. But the point, why have we not defaulted before? I'm sorry, people, I recommend anybody, I'm going to have to say the G word, anyone goes and reads Alan Greenspan's essay, Golden Economic Freedom, the reason that the state hasn't defaulted over a long period, I believe, is because we've had a chronically expansionary monetary system since the end of Bretton Woods, the year I was born. And if you're in a position where the money supply keeps increasing, that, that takes away some of the pain. And Greenspan, of all, I mean, I, I like Greenspan because people know him, you know, so it's not some crazy, cr like Hayek or whatever, it's Greenspan. <laughs> but the, the, point, the point I'm making is that the answer to these problems is a conservatism that we all believe in. And we're in a moment where we've got a big majority. We've had unforeseen circumstances which need to be dealt with, not least because they've thrown us 25 years down this dreadful de debt trajectory. And we've actually got a moral imperative to act because we can't just keep grinding forward and every few years let the OBR tell us that the public finances are unsustainable in the long run and then do nothing about it. It's wrong. So... 
there, there's a lot I want to see done, um, and I'm happy that I've got this opportunity. I hope we get through it all. In yeah, I'm sure we're, we're, we'll solve it all. We'll solve it all. We've got off to a good start. We've got to bring hope. We've well, got we've, to bring, bring hope. we've got to start by actually sort of analysing the problem before we cut it out, right? And my worry is that these short-term moves, let's take the government's uh, national insurance rise to pay for social care. Uh, 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 I mean, that's not the way I would pay for social care. We're, it looks like we're going to nationalise social care rather than look to market solutions for social care. But I don't think it will even work in its own terms because the idea is we're going to pay for more, you know, more in national insurance. Apparently, this is going to help the National Health Service for three years. But then in three years' time, the National Health Service is going to turn around and say to the government, good news, we don't actually need any more money now. Uh, we, the National Health Service, got more than enough money. It's coming out of our ears. So you can now earmark this for social care. That yeah. will never happen. This is just actually going to be a levy that goes for NHS funding. So we haven't even started to tackle the social care funding problem. This is just an illusion that we're tackling it, isn't it? Yes, it probably is an illusion. What I would say is that when I first got into politics, the first thing I did, did uh, was go and do some work for the Centre for Social Justice because I think we, as Conservatives, must have really good working answers to poverty fighting or we're wasting everybody's time. We should be winning elections because we deserve to win elections and we, and we will deserve to win elections because we've done the right thing. So the first thing I did, even, even as a libertarian, which put them off a bit, um, was go and work with the CSJ. And one of the people I was sent to see, it was a sort of implementation program, what, like management consulting, what would we need to do to get stuff done? But one of the people I met was writing for Gordon Pratt Brown a plan for a, a national care service, which, of course, David Cameron and George Osborne canned as one of the first things we did. But one of the things that happens is none of these ideas ever really die. People who believe in them go off elsewhere in the system and bring them back. And uh, um, I, I think we're headed towards a depart what is now titled the Department for Health and Social Care, inevitably, I think, being faced with a suggestion that we make it a national health and care service, and we will end up with uh, a major nationalised care industry as well. And you've just got to ask yourself, is it, is it going to work or is it also going to be unaffordable? So, you, you know, a, a policy of interventionism is a policy of the realisation of socialism by decrees. I'm sure someone famous said that once upon a time and, and I'm afraid that is what we're doing and if we're serious about human prosperity and let's not forget what I want is a society where we can be prosperous and free and happy wouldn't that be nice well, but we're not if we're, if we're serious about prosperity I think, I think that's a fourth term commitment that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff isn't it <laughs> but if, we, if we're going to be prosperous and free and happy we're not going to adopt socialism are we because every time it's tried it's a disaster and promotes misery in fact you guys are handing out I, Mark didn't know I was going to do this but I'd like to uh, uh, advertise the little red book to you all. If anybody wants to see the disastrous record, oh, that's a good one, the decline of Venezuela's GDP. It's a, it's a tale of absolute human misery. And I don't want us to be miserable and poor. I want us to be happy and free. So let's do capitalism, not socialism. Right, OK. <laughs> OK, I'm going to reach for an upbeat note here then, right? So, uh, you, you and I, I think, for similar reasons, uh, were on the same side of the Brexit debate, that we thought that the European Union had become an over-interventionist, uh, busy-body, over-regulatory um, body. I didn't think that Leave would win the referendum. I thought Remain would probably win the referendum. But Brexit won, and has also been got over the line, despite the efforts of uh, many in the political establishment to frustrate it. That should be a pretty substantial opportunity for an independent United Kingdom, shouldn't it? Notwithstanding the fiscal position, suddenly we've got a lot of you know, levers we can pull. I don't usually like that analogy. It suggests socialist central planning. But there are things we can now do to liberalise that we couldn't previously do. Yep. And your own, the IEA's own Plan A+, Plus includes a range of suggestions. It's not a... There's no question, the, the UK is not going to become the Wild West. It's not even going to become Singapore. It, but we do need to have welfare-enhancing, pro-competitive regulations of the kind that we would have had to simply adopt from the EU after all of their horse trading. But if I may, just to rewind, the reason that I wanted to leave the European Union is because they proceeded with implementing stru new structures of power positively against the democratic wishes of the electorates they asked. You know, people rejected the Constitution for Europe 
So instead of coming up with a better idea, they came up with the Lisbon Treaty with the same substance. Now, this might all seem very otios and arcane and boring for people, but what I took from it was they just really didn't give a toss what the public thought of their plan. And that is not acceptable in a democratic and free society. So I'm afraid I went from being a Euro-Federalist in favour of the Euro to being really quite firmly for leave. Same um, journey as myself. There yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. But we've done it, and I think now's the time to try and be gracious to the Remain side of the argument and try and move on and make the most of it. But one thing about this, Mark, when, when, when I went out there and said the Eurosceptics and about Boris's deal... We said it was a tolerable path to a great future. The bit that made it a tolerable path was that the Northern Ireland Protocol is unfinished business. And we knew that. So we've got to do things with the Northern Ireland Protocol so that goods not at risk, which is the term that's used, so that goods not at risk can fl flow freely between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and reverse, just completely freely. Now that this should not be beyond the wit of man, right? It, it is an administrative problem, and a previous leader of the Republic uh, knew that, but unfortunately it's been hugely politicised. And what I would say to the people politicising it is, you need to remember that the Good Friday Agreement applies east-west as well as north-south. And if you're really respecting and honouring the Good Friday Agreement and the people of Northern Ireland, and frankly the memories of those who died, that you must respect the Good Friday Agreement east-west as well as north-south. Mm -hmm. And people don't have to listen to me on this. They can listen to people like David Trimble uh, on it. And it's really important. We've got to deal with it. And at the moment, one of the problems we have is I keep meeting embassies from around Europe who just keep rehearsing the same old lines about we have to just implement it. Yep. Well, if they want peace and prosperity and to be great neighbours, then they have to genuinely respect our territorial integrity. And that means completely free movement of goods east-west for us. OK, let's say we can just magically crack the Northern Ireland Protocol. I know there's a lot of administrative problems there. What, what approach do you think we should take? And I've got some optimism that Lord David Frost might take some of this lead with the regulations we've inherited. Because part of the Eurosceptic story over many years was... I mean, some of it was whimsical, you know, sort of absurd regulations rather than the ones that are necessarily extraordinarily damaging. I'm not sure how regulating the curvature of fruit necessarily destroys the British GDP, but there was a whole, you know, plethora of regulations. Now, we decided to basically take the acquis communautaire and cut and paste it into British law for the time being, right? I mean, that was my understanding, for the time being to provide regulatory certainty to British businesses. Nothing will change overnight. But I was kind of then hopeful we would go through it with a fine tooth comb and say, well, actually, this bit's fine. Well, probably that's probably what we would do in Britain anyway. This bit we want to amend and this bit we want to rescind. Is, is that project getting underway any time soon? Yeah, so there has been this so-called Tigger project, which was done by Ian Duncan Smith, Theresa Villiers and George Freeman. Really good piece of work. I handed over to them everything that I'd prepared, or that I still had, rather, uh, from my time as Brexit minister when I had some degree of responsibility. I actually look back and I think, what was I not responsible for? I had the, <laughs> the, the regulatory piece, the legislation and the domestic preparedness, uh, amongst other things. So I was quite busy. But I, I handed over to them everything I had. A lot of that's made it into their report, and it this just needs to be carried forward. But the reason that I brought the Northern Ireland Protocol up with this is that at the moment we are tethered to their system, which I believe they meant us to be, and that is not acceptable. Respecting our decision to me, leave means making it possible uh, to be, leave as one United Kingdom. And also, we need to respect the integrity of their market, and there's methods. But if we were to start changing the way we regulate the UK it will increasingly demonstrate that Northern Ireland has been left behind in the EU. And it, it's not acceptable. And that's why we only ever said it was a tolerable path to a great future. Pe people in this room will remember just how much political duress the whole nation was under throughout this period. And that duress matters. And it matters in international law as well. So um, we've got to sort out Northern Ireland. I think if we're serious about being two trusted partners, we can do it. Uh, but it is an administrative problem they've got to be willing to solve. Once they've done that, we can start regulating differently, and the Tigger report is the beginning. I want to look at another area of liberties, because um, the, all of the liberties we lost during the, the, the COVID lockdown, and I can remember watching you give um, a, a fantastic speech oh, in thanks. Parliament at the, the time of the, at the time of the legislation going through, and um, you, you, you were nearly moved to tears by the issue you could see on camera 
And you're the hard man of Brexit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a softie yeah. of Brexit. So, so I was that blubbing point, Mark, like that, a baby that, 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 of what right, you were that, saying. That, yeah. This is the worst mistake, Mark, I ever made. And I'm grateful in the privacy of this room <laughs> to have the opportunity to confess. It was ironic because only the night before I'd been pictured on Laura Koonsberg's documentary, literally with a tear on my cheek after speaking to an MP. And that, that same day, some journalist, and forgive me, I can't remember who it was, had called me the hard man of Brexit. Right. And I was daft enough to repeat it on Sky News. Mm -hmm. Uh, ironically, because I'd been seen crying on the TV. It's only the once I've said it, and now I've got to put up with even my friends. There you go. I'm sorry. Repeating I'm sorry. it. So it's the worst mistake I ever made. But but the it, it was quite disturbing to see. But what, what I'm not um, criticising the intentions of the government, but how rapidly, how swiftly, a swathe of liberties that we would have taken completely for granted were suspended. Yeah. Um, I don't want to go through all of the difficult judgments the government had to make. I want to ask you, are you very confident we are swiftly going to get them all back? Or are you concerned about Friedrich Hayek's idea that this is another step on the road to serfdom? You know, when the state takes a big leap forward, uh, which it does at speed, it takes forever and a day to unravel it all. Or is this government going to have the wisdom, the foresight, the classical liberal instincts to really end the interventions as soon as this pandemic has passed, which is pretty much now, right? So practically, we need to reform the way government works. We need a new Public Health Act, which increases the extent of parliamentary scrutiny. We need competitive expert advice with Red Team Challenge. So, by the way, Lord Sumption helped me with a draft of the new Public Health Act, or at least an outline of it. Professor Roger Koppel on expert advice. Professor Paul Dolan on how we can do well-being-based uh, um, cost-benefit analysis, which, by the way, could be used right across government to deliver better policy. Uh, and we need desperately to reform the way that modelling is done, because how many times has it been wrong and how tyrannical have the consequences been? T terrible. And we need to do those four things, and it's really urgent that we do it. Unfortunately, from my conversations with Number 10, I'm very clear that they're just going to punt it into the long grass and hope for the best that we don't have another pandemic. And I think that's a massive opportunity missed. Right across swathes of public policy, science and power are tightly interwoven, as they have been for a long time. And we have to find institutional ways of making sure that democratic control of that power is upheld. And those ways, I've done the research, I've published it out there. It's up to Boris and the government whether they do the right things. I've briefed ministers. It's all, they're just too busy coping. But I actually expect more from those who govern us, govern me. I mean, I, I have a vote in the House of Commons and perhaps some influence occasionally, organisationally, but I'm not a minister. But I actually want more from ministers than just coping day to day. It's pathetic. We, 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 we should... I, I don't want art to be governed by ideologues either, but as an engineer... I do. Yeah. Well... <laughs> <laughs> As an engineer, I appreciate, and a chartered aerospace engineer from the past, I appreciate the value of ideas informing action. And it, it's genuinely dangerous in engineering if you have somebody carrying out maintenance operations on an aeroplane without knowing what they're doing, right? Sure. Isn't it? But what happens with politics, we've got people, it turns out I'm one of the better red MPs. I only started reading into it two years before I went, decided to try and get elected. It's ridiculous. There are people who've studied politics their, their whole lives who can't have a discussion you and I could easily have about justice, rules mm -hmm. versus knows it. It's pathetic. And this lack of any kind of fixed ideological keel means that the ship of state is constantly tossed about when it's at sea in a storm. And, and, and again, I, I watch in despair, but I refuse to despair because actually we've got, we as leaders of our society, and that includes all of you because you're all here taking an interest, We've got to bring hope, right? And the hope comes from understanding what goes wrong in society and having practical ideas which will work and then having the courage to use an 80-seat majority to carry them through. But very practically to your point, we are getting our freedoms back. Look at us here. Nobody's, nobody's wearing a mask. We're all sitting together like normal. So practically, our freedoms are basically back. But hanging over us, the sword of Damocles, the unreformed Public Health Act 1984, which has revealed to all that we live under an omnipotent power which can, to the most minute extent, take away our freedoms and should close our businesses at, at, at the swipe of a minister's pen. And there's practically nothing Parliament can do to stop it because we delegated those powers. Now, that isn't going to... Th this, this concern is not going to make the headlines tomorrow unless I manage to find some additional way to dress it up for the few <laughs> journalists who are in the room. But, 
But every serious one of us who cares about power and accountability and democracy and rights and liberty and freedom and happiness and all the great array words, justice, should care that ministers could just, Sajid, could later today just sign an instrument that requires us all to be at home tomorrow. And I don't want to live under such a power anymore. I want to change that power. Yeah. So, um, Steve, let me move on to another area that I know you've taken uh, quite recently a very keen interest in, and I'm sure that you can tell me is something we can solve extremely cheaply and extremely quickly. Carbon net zero by January 2050. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? Uh, what, what sort of burden is this going to place on the economy? I have to say I'm not a climate change denier. I mean, I think... Um, Greenhouse gases do warm the, warm the environment. I'm just not sure that this is the best way of tackling that problem, and it's certainly a very expensive way of tackling that problem. And again, it doesn't seem that there's a great deal of money sloshing around at the moment. Well, details are very boring, aren't they, for politicians and politics? Much better to have hand-waving desires and ambitions for what we might do and not really worry about how it's going to get done. That is, of course, the road to ruin in public policy and happens all too often. There are about four conversations, four categories of conversation we can have about climate change and net zero. Why do we need to do something? And that is very clear. A lot of the science is absolutely settled. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We've emitted plenty of it. That will have contributed to climate change. Lots of it is actually still contestable, but that's not really the point. And I'm interested as I am as a chartered aerospace engineer who used to work on thermodynamics with an MSc in computer science capable of understanding models. Fascinated as I am... I am not having That's that not the nub of the issue. I am not having that conversation about the science. There's the science. But, but I have to say the science is sometimes propagandised. So RCP 8.5 would require us to even start getting our petrol from coal. And it isn't going to happen. What's RCP 8.5? A, a relative carbon path. There's an expert in the room who tell us about it in a minute. But relative carbon path 8.5, the most dramatic and scary IPC scenarios, the extreme ones that lead to disaster and doom, aren't going to happen. They are implausible. So that's the why conversation. I'm not actually having that conversation. I do think we need to do something. Something must be done. And by the way, even if you didn't believe the science, which you should, it's not actually a very good idea to base the lives of billions of people on burning a finite resource. So getting to net zero is a good idea, right? The second thing is, what are we going to do? Well, we've said we're going to net zero by a date. It's in law. So let's take that for granted as well. Then the question, the third big category of conversation is how. And this is the boring details. And it turns out when the boring details are put before the public, they don't survive contact with the electorate. So like the boiler ban has just mm -hmm. been kicked into the long dust. But well, what next? Because the, what politicians have not done, and enthusiasts for all of this have not done, is explain to the public just how real and impactful all of this is going to be. It will change the way we work, the way we relax, the way we transport ourselves. Uh, it will change even what we eat. There was a government report in the sun, I couldn't believe, it's too absurd, you couldn't make it up, but saying that we're going to have to get our protein from insects. I mean, it's, it sounds like a joke, except they mean it. Um, <laughs> so um, I would like, at the absolute minimum, a really full and frank conversation from ministers to the public about what it's really going to mean for you. Because I go and speak at schools... Wickham High School particularly comes to mind. They're never very patient with me. But they, I'm quite sure those young ladies in sixth form will be learning to drive. And they will have an ambition to get themselves about with freedom to go where they want, when they want, how they like, in their own car. Who wouldn't? Well, mm -hmm. some don't, but, you know. Most do. But equally, they're going to find, as one of the major chief executives of a car manufacturer said, that they're not going to be able to afford a car. Yeah. Well, we should start explaining to them what all this is going to mean to them, that they are going to be poorer, they're going to be colder, and they can expect, if that report is right, to be eating insects for protein. And we should be asking them, is that really what is they want? Is that what they want to vote for? So do, do, you, make, do you think the rise of... Um... Oh, sorry, the fourth conversation is the what if. What if we do, what if we don't? Yeah. Why, what, how, what if? So what if we don't do anything? Well, so nobody's proposing that we do nothing. I'm not proposing that we do nothing. We should be building up nuclear, whether it's small, modular, or big ones. Big ones, by the way, why don't we use the same design several times? As an engineer, it's madness. No, what is it? <laughs> Economies of scale and all yeah. that. But. 
we, 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 keep we keep redesigning billion pound <laughs> nuclear plants and then wondering why they keep getting more expensive. Let's design a good one and then have marginal Replicate. improvements. Or small modular. There's also something wonderful called an alum cycle, closed cycle gas turbine, which we can put gas through. But because it's a closed cycle, burns gas in supercritical CO2, which I know you're dying to ask me about. Um, <laughs> but that means that you can capture all the carbon dioxide. So there's plenty of stuff we can do that can get our emissions down, which we can afford, which won't end up uh, doing something which, frankly, I think it'd be just like Brexit. All the political parties agree we need to do it. It'll have a profound impact on people's lives. Only a tiny number of geeks care about it. But when eventually it starts becoming real, and all the, no, no political party is given a choice, then you'll have some revolutionary political acts. But the difference between net zero and Brexit is that Brexit was not very widely understood by the whole population. But when you're poorer and colder, I'm forgetting about the insects for a minute, but when you're poorer and you're colder... And eating an insect and, sandwich. And eating an insect sandwich, and you can't go and see your mum because you've run out of whatever social credits you needed to drive your car today, all the rest of it, the, the, the kind of restrictions on what we currently re re regard as normal life... Um, it will, th th these various crunch points will come to bear on people, and then there'll be something, I would say, far worse than the poll tax... Because the poll tax, um, in the end, most, many people could afford to pay the poll tax, but we're going to find that absolutely everyone's affected mm -hmm. by the consequences of rushing to net zero. So even if people don't like me talking about this stuff, and I see I've had a Conservative put up to attack me again over this, and I don't care about being attacked. Have people learned nothing watching me in Brexit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, being attacked is good. Dominic Cummings taught me that one thing at least. Double down. If he does take it to an extreme, if, though, it's yeah, fair yeah. to say. <laughs> if they're attacking you, double down. Right? And get, the, and get the message out there. So let me just put out there for people, you attack away. And every time you attack, I'm doubling down. Because I am not willing to go forwards into a place that is another disaster, political disaster, like the political process of the last few years. And I think it would be even worse, and the public deserve better from their politicians than wishful thinking about how we might magically get there. So let me ask you a bit then on... But what do you make of the apparent phenomenon of Extinction Rebellion and environmentalist activism? I mean, you, you, would, you might get the impression, I would think, to sort of look at the news or to observe the blocked-up streets of London, that there are rather more people who are exercised about tackling this problem fast at almost any expense than there are people who are worried about the insect sandwich problem, right? I haven't seen them out protesting... Anyway, well, it's too absurd, isn't it? Apart from but, anything else, it's just that it's a real well. I find Extinction report. Rebellion a little absurd as well. In the kind of you know, it seems to be more an organisation to do with performance, performative street theatre than policy. I've no, um, I have no objection to performative street theatre. No, it just shouldn't stop ambulances getting through. Yeah, no, exactly right, exactly right. But that the impression is this is where the worries of the public are. You know, not enough's being done well, fast enough. Rather than, ooh, are we approaching this in the right way? Shouldn't we actually have small modular nuclear reactors instead? I'm a bit worried I'm not going to be able to afford a car. These people are hardly taken to the streets, right? So I'd say two points about that. First, I but genuinely believe that the vast majority of people getting involved with the Extinction Rebellion absolutely mean well and aren't bought into its founders' ideology and tactics. Uh, they're kind, well-meaning people who care about the environment. And secondly, when I, whenever I go to schools, I would say that young people really are exercised about this issue. Mm -hmm. They have been absolutely terrified about it uh, and, and by it. And um, that over the course of the next few years, you know, that as more and more young voters are out there voting, uh, we've got to care about it. Now, I do care about it. You have to be a fool not to care about it. Um, and I think anybody denying that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it matters what we've emitted is wasting everyone's time. Mm -hmm. But even if you are in favour of radically decarbonising, radically, even faster, you should be able to agree with me that your plans to do so need to be politically and economically viable using current technology. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not politically and economically viable using current technology, again, you're wasting everyone's time. So I think this is partly why I've been so attacked so much, because it's actually quite difficult to have this argument. Um, and people need to start getting practical and real. And those environmentalists who say to the public, you're going to have to become poorer, people who talk about degrowth, they, they should be really honest and say, yeah. you're going to become poorer. Never mind. We, we, the, the insanity, I'm sorry, of people juxtaposing 
uh, demands for net zero and also worrying about fuel poverty. Because the, yeah, pick the, a lane. The, the, yeah. well, what are we trying to do here, and what I would like us to deliver, is all round prosperity, inclusive, sustainable, and just, and give everybody an opportunity to be better off. Isn't that what we're trying to do? But what we're going to end up doing at the moment is going down a path where the poorest are going to be even worse off because of what we're doing to their gas bills and their electricity supply. And, you know, again, there's an expert in the room to tell you all about the relative contribution of state action and markets to the overall uh, height of, uh, of our energy bills. Um, but it's, it's not a pretty picture. And time and again, going back to my earlier theme, whenever you look at something that's going wrong in the world, one of the things we should all do, all of us certainly, but the media should do as well, is ask, how is the state getting this wrong? Because we don't live in the era of laissez-faire. Almost mm -hmm. any major issue is going to have massive state intervention, and the energy market is a particular example. So we should be asking, what's the state doing wrong? Do you think it's going to be possible to generate uh, a sensible, intelligent, possibly even technical and boring arg you know, argument and discussion about this in public discourse? I was very struck that... The, the last um, XR um, uh, protests were literally badged under demand the impossible. So if the yeah. Prime Minister appears on the balcony and says, I'm willing to concede all of your demands, he can't even do it because they're, they're accepting themselves that they're making impossible claims. Do you think it would be possible in this crucial area, I mean, this is not a rounding error on the public finances or on the private sector's finances. This is a massive enterprise. Yep. And at the moment, it seems to be ships passing in the night or possibly passing in the night and screaming at each other as they do. So that, that points to a wider problem that we have, is we're not listening to each other and crediting one another with good faith and intelligence, at least at normal levels. And our opponents particularly do it, as I'm afraid we just saw, calling us scum and all the rest of it. And actually, we just got to have thick enough skins to get over it, which the first few years I was a politician, I didn't have, but I did have subsequently developed. Um, most people are as honest as anyone else, as in, you know, at least averagely intelligent, you'd expect. Um, and well motivated, and they want, you know, it's the old theory of moral, moral sentiment stuff from Adam Smith. They want other people to be better off. And if only we could conduct all politics on the basis of these common assumptions that we do care about one another, we could have, start having a serious conversation. But there is a real problem at the moment that we seem to have entrenched this philosophy of irreconcilable conflict and division, that there's only the poles and nothing in the middle. And actually, we need to learn to be tolerant. And of course, to be tolerant is to agree to disagree to accept that some people are eco-anarchists, and I'm never going to be, and I can respect their right to articulate their point of view, and they can respect my right to say that they're absolutely categorically wrong, and it would be totally destructive of our civilization if they won. But that doesn't mean I think they're bad people. Mm -hmm. I just think they're profoundly wrong and would destroy civilization. But they don't mean to. Mm -hmm. they're, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're sincere, and they, and they generally want the best for mankind. Yeah, you? but they're terrified, and they're terrified over things they ought not to be terrified about. And there's a difficult thing to be done here, because somehow you've got to explain that they're wrongly terrified without seeming patronising, and that's quite a hard problem. But there's a, a thing I said at an earlier thing. It's absolutely Im Im imperative for all of us as, to do what I hope I'm managing to do today, is not to seem angry or despairing or condemning or, or, or anything negative. Because we're in a really, I think on this particular issue of net zero and on the debt we were talking about earlier, we're in a really dramatically important period in our history. And we better make sure we attract people, attract people to our way of thinking. Because we're not going to drive them to our way of thinking by criticising and condemning and complaining and being angry. Mm -hmm. So, St Steve, I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'm going to come to the floor to, uh, for questions. So if you were just beginning to germinate one in your mind, you know, Bring that to fruition in the next minute or two and shove your hand in the air. I'll get as many in as I can. Someone asked me about planning. Um, <laughs> we've already planted two of those questions. They'll be the first in the air. Um, the, the job of the IA, we're, we're, we're not a partisan outfit. It's to spread free market ideas everywhere, Steve, as you know, within political parties, but in civil society as well. To, to what extent, Steve, do you think that your and the IA's broad analysis is shared within the Conservative Party, even if not within the government. Is this still, in any way, the orthodoxy of members of the Conservative Party, your parliamentary colleagues? Or are you, you know, a lone maverick, you know, one voice that, you know, therefore you need to speak crystal clear and very loud, 
or do you think these broad ideas of freedom and individual men and women and voluntary exchange being the solution to most, certainly many of our problems, not the state, is a widespread view within the Conservative Party or not anymore? People may have seen that I stood up in the middle of the House of Commons during the debate on the national insurance levy and said this was what Labour would do and then went on to explain why it was that we would have to rediscover what it meant to be a Conservative. And one of the reasons I've started to like standing in the middle is that your colleagues can't help but look at you. And I stood there and I looked out like I can look at all of you now, at lots of MPs looking at me. And you know you can tell when you've carried a room, can't you? Yeah. Those Conservative MPs were looking at me wishing that they were what, where I was setting out. And that gave me enormous, immeasurable hope. Those Conservative Members of Parliament, if asked to go through the lobbies for solid, classical, liberal, conservative ideas of freedom, the kind of freedom, frankly, the kind of ideas and commitment and principle, frankly, of the Thatcher era, if they were asked to go through the lobbies for that and be brave to do the right thing, knowing that it was in the public interest, they just go through that. They wouldn't just vote for it. they go through like spring lambs. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing what's happening now, we are grinding miserably forward doing Ed Miliband's Labour Party's policies, and we're hating it every minute and trying to claim it's conservatism and that really our hearts are somewhere else. But eventually the public will look at what we're doing and say, well, they say their heart's somewhere else, but look what they're doing. And you just can't keep doing, you can't keep doing that. You can't keep taking people for fools. We've got to say what we mean. We've got to decide what we think. Having decided what we think, we've then got to articulate it honestly and then actually do those policies. Mm -hmm. And it will be hard. And we'll have to justify ourselves under a real glare of scrutiny and hard questions. But we are in politics because we're interested in it, right? I mean, you're not here because you like things to be easy or boring. You'd, go and some, you'd be in, the, I don't know, the Liberal Democrats or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah, we're, we are here because the Conservative Party is the best hope we have for good quality government. There's only two parties that can govern the country, and we're one of them, and we're the only party capable of doing what's right. So I would say it's time to, time to choose. Okay. Uh, I, I'm happy to keep asking questions, but I'm also very keen to take any questions from the floor. Especially about planning. Um, <laughs> and I just want to say, I'm not quite sure who's got the microphones. Uh, we've got one microphone over there. So uh, let me uh, take a question on the aisle here. Let me take these three gentlemen here. We'll take three and come back to you, starting with the gentleman in the... Uh, Liberal Democrat yellow jumper, um, as, uh, as Steve was just reaching out to you. Uh, please say who you are, where you're from, if you're willing to share that information with us, and a question or a comment, a speech of no more than one sentence that ends in a question mark. You choose. So, sir. Uh, Mason Thorpe, Fabsham, uh, Mitzken. I was just going to ask, how do we transition as the, the government doesn't have to excessively spend money and waste resources in order to combat uh, climate change and in order to reach net zero. It can be done. For example, if you've seen over the past 10 years, the cost of renewable energy has gone down tenfold. The cost has gone down. It's a lot more productive. The state's not needed. How do we transition to that? And the gentleman next to you, I think, wanted to ask a question. Yeah, er sorry, earlier when you were talking about... Do you about mind introducing yourself? Uh, sorry, my name's uh, Nick Papiwan. Um, I'm just a standard member. Um, but I was... Um, yeah, earlier you were talking about Brexit and you were saying it's important, worse the effect of, to be sort of magnanimous in victory and to try to put it behind us. I think that's right on one level. But on another level, Brexit continues to be a huge sore in the country. Uh, and I think it will be a sore that continues to run. And maybe in 10 years' time you could say, oh, well, look at all the good that Brexit did. But until then, I think, you know, almost like the war was won on Brexit, but the peace hasn't been won. And it's quite an easy one to win by saying, well, you said this would happen, and it just hasn't happened. You said you'd never get nine years for a trade deal. Turns out that wasn't the case. You said that jobs were going to be lost. Turns out that wasn't the case. And I think if maybe some of that was in place, it might help those wounds heal quicker than they are. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Okay, and then the gentleman behind you. Hi Steve, my name is Paul Benstead, I'm at uh, Altrincham and Sale West. Um, I actually grew up in High Wycombe. Great. Um, I live up here now, um, and of course you started your introduction um, about you know, um, the number of food banks in High Wycombe. How do you look at um, what do you suggest for levelling up High Wycombe 
to um, some of the other areas in the southeast or indeed just to the north. Okay, so just to remind you, Steve, as you're scribbling away, yeah. um, uh, Paul's asked about High Wycombe levelling up. I, I still haven't quite got my head around what levelling up means, but maybe you can help me with that. I'm like you, I just want all human beings to get more prosperous. Um, Mason asked about this transition to new technologies that you know might look expensive at first, but they become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You know, how do we uh, do the transition? And Nick asked a very interesting question about how magnanimous should we be. Um, I, I can't remember what it was. There was some incident, and I said, oh, I'm going to say this. And somebody said to me, well, Mark, don't, don't kick a man when they're down. And I said, well, why? I'm five foot nine. I'm a weakling. The easiest time to kick a man when he's down, it would be foolish to kick a man when he's up. But do you think that the, uh, do you think on Brexit that Nick's point was right, that we, we haven't sort of won the peace that, you, that needs to become, it, it isn't yet accepted as a fact. It does still, in some corners of society, seem to be being contested or fought over. Where do you want me to start? Yeah, your pick. Right, Mason, transition. I would like, Harry, put your hand up. Not the one at the back, the one at the front. No, this, this Harry, yeah. This is Harry. Harry will explain to you the cost of energy has not come down in the way that you think it has. Pardon? But, no, no, so just have a chat with him, because you're going to discover that he'll probably recommend you to a lot of excellent reading, which will show that there's a so lot of... So we can't transition just by lower costs, we, you're saying. No, I'm saying that the, the, the cost of renewable energy has not come down in the way that even the Prime Minister thinks it has. But I want to park that by saying anybody wants to know about it, put, talk to Go this Harry. To Harry. Yeah. Um, um, but what we need, in a nutshell, sir, I would say is we need evolution, not revolution. I am, after all, a Conservative. And I, so I would say, you know, the nuclear, the alum cycle, gas turbines, let's for goodness sake use the shale gas under our feet. It's part of us. It's far better to do that than to use coal that we've imported from somewhere else. So that's, that's that one. The Brexit thing, Nick, I totally agree with you. We haven't won the peace, and I would like to. Um, knocking on doors in Wickham in 2019 was extremely painful. I'd had to have a far more prominent role than I would have liked, and I'd had to be far more hard over than I would have liked. And the result was... Some absolutely solid, some of my best streets, I mean, absolutely solid hour streets. Big million, two million pound houses, long drives, Porsche and BMW as a choice. Hated me. Shut the door in my face. Really painful. I'm 2,000 votes down this election. That will I might have gained some Labour Brexiteers, I know I did. But I lost more, I think, so I think I've, I've lost more than 2,000 Conservative Remainers. I want them back. I actually, it actually, it hurts that I lost them. They might not believe me, but it hurts that it lo I lost them. I didn't want to piss them off like that. I, I spent ages on the phone with an Italian guy who was really angry and upset. Thought all sorts of things about my views that I didn't think had been projected on to me. And do you know what, at the end of it, he said, well, I might vote for you. I said, do you know what, I didn't have this conversation for that reason. We got a lot of hurt out there, and I honestly don't know the answer, but anybody's got the answers for how we put it right, do it right, heal these wounds fast as possible, I'm absolutely up for hearing those ideas. But it's really the most painful thing in my political career is how much hurt and division there has been over this issue, partly because of lies which have been told all round, all round. You know, I've been, compared, I've been called worse than the Nazis by a Christian brother. By a Christian brother called me worse than the Nazis. So I don't like that very much. <laughs> but so everybody needs to stop lying about everybody else and start crediting people with a bit of good faith and they might, might get somewhere. Um, so, High, High Wycombe's got one food bank and it's a bit of an industrial scale operation. It was until recently chaired by a friend of mine at my church and I've just been down to see him and go through all the data. I have to say, have they, they have been polling their customers. Who asked me about food banks? Sorry, it was you. They asked, asked me about their, They've been polling their customers, and I, expect, I hoped and expected to see a very few consistent themes, like universal credit and housing costs. But there was a real scattergun of reasons why people are there, often moments of crisis. But what I would say is that there's a real problem in Wickham that we're close to London. And that two problems there. Housing costs are very high, relatively. And also people come out of London with, with problems and they've been overspilled and placed into Wickham. But I'm absolutely determined we've got to do stuff about it. But since I'm on this point, I'm going to answer a question about planning. <laughs> right, so no. So on universal credit, we have got to find about 10 billion to put it right. If Mark and I tomorrow seized power and implemented our libertarian utopia, 
I dare say that Mark and I would need a practical, realistic, and affordable way to make sure there was a working safety net for the poorest, wouldn't we? Yeah. And that working safety net is called universal credit. It needs about six billion to retain the 20 quid, which, by the way, doesn't completely cover the way that uh, inflation undermined it. We should be, I think, be on honest about that. We should also deal with the work allowance and the taper rate. And also, I believe we should write off people's loans. They should have just, when you signed on, when people signed on to UC, they should have just been given the money because they needed it. And, and we, some of the things we've done, I don't think we should have done. And it's about a 10 billion package to put it right. But that's a sixth of the defence budget. So whatever ministers decide, I'm going to vote with ministers on tax and spend. But we do need to find 10 billion for universal credit. And I've said to the chief secretary and others, you should make it a priority in the spending review. Back to that point about we should win elections because we deserve to win elections. And we should deserve to win elections because we've cared for the poorest. That doesn't mean we should have a very comfy cushion like Labour would give, but we should have a, a universal credit system that we can actually be proud of. And at the moment, I'm not very proud of the level of it. Um, the other issue, to, to, I can't help myself, on the planning, <laughs> state land use planning. One of the problems with the Conservative Party today is that we haven't spotted that the problem with state land use planning is that it is planning, planning of land use by the state. <laughs> It's insane. We've operated this system since 1947, the Town and Country Planning Act, and people keep telling me that they care about place. Oh, well, that's nice. I care about place too. Most of the places that we value were built before the Town and Country Planning Act. And then, meanwhile, we've got this massive problem with housing, and people suddenly, I've just been reading the last couple of days, that Michael Gove and others have caught up with what I've been saying for 10 years, that cheap credit drives up house costs, housing costs. Yeah, of course. Oh. I told you so. <laughs> so here we are. We've got a state-directed monetary system which pumps out cheap credit, tripling the money supply between 1997 and 2010, which might, have I put it to you, have something to do with the enormous increase in house prices and assets. Great floods of new credit and a lot of socialised risks. And we've got a state land use planning system which seeks to impose the externalities of building new houses on people without real compensation. And here we are as Conservatives. We can't spot it's socialism. It's driving me absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, due to the IEA and a publication called Liberating the Land, we do know what to do in order to make sure that people can have the opportunity, and this is really important, have the opportunity to refuse new development, the opportunity, the power to refuse new development, but the incentive to say yes. When I stood up in the House of Commons and explained Pennington's book, Liberating the Land, my voters who were interested at the time gave me very positive feedback. But what we need to do, I'm afraid, is we need to abolish state land use planning and instead institute a system based on property rights and compensation for external externalities, and, and, and including the power to say no, the incentives to say yes, yeah. so that then we can actually get the housing we need in the places we need it in a way that commands public consent. But all the time we press on trying to make socialism work, we're going to fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I just, um, on the universal credit issue, I don't want to get into the weeds of it so much, but my concern is that, the, not that there should be no welfare safety net, but that we've seen transfer payments, simply taking cash from one cohort and transferring it to other, going up and up and up and up and up. The, the, the cost is now, in rough terms, uh, the, the cost of welfare transfer payments, I'm including state pensions in this, £10,000 per household per year. We should have been able to solve poverty for that. Yeah. As Ronnie Reagan said, somewhere there must be some overhead. Uh, otherwise, we would have cracked it. And this is why I'm a bit sceptical about the just another £20 on universal credit, render it permanent. I don't think we're going to crack this problem by dialing that up to £11,000 per household per year. Something is going systemically wrong on our transfer payments to relieve poverty, no? Absolutely 100% agreed, and Reagan's time for choosing speech repays close reading and translating to today. And if only somebody would make an attempt to stand up somewhere in London in the beginning of December to make a wide-ranging speech which sought to land some of these points, Mark. If only that would happen, how happy I would be. Very well put. We're right on the clock, but I will try and take um, uh, a few more questions. Let me go over, to, over that side of the room. Lady, back, right at the back there, then... Two along, 
and then I'll come to the gentleman at the front there. So again, if you could introduce yourself yeah. and keep your speech to a sentence, that would be grand. No problem. Um, my name's Emily, and I'm from Northamptonshire. I know it's not exactly the most pressing issue of the day, and it is a bit more light-hearted, but do you think the next James Bond should be a girl? And if not, it, and if not do you think you'd be a good James Bond? Uh, <laughs> Emily, you're, you're, you're my, Emily, look, you're look, my look, absolute look. new favourite. <laughs> and I think, yes, gentlemen, gentlemen just worth, again, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name's James Hamblin. Uh, I'm from John McDonald's People's Republic of Hazen Harlington. And uh, my question is about um, uh, basically big tech surveillance. Uh, you know, I think as Conservatives, we need to be concerned not just about the loss of our civil liberties from the state, but also by private corporations. And so what can we do about the growth in kind of surveillance by kind of big tech companies? OK. And then the gentleman on the front row here I saw as well. Hi, my name is Ian Craig. I'm from Belfast. Uh, I regret to say that my son uh, last week smuggled sausages from uh, Makatamni's butchers from Belfast to Galway uh, for... Capital offence, that one, for, I thought. For my nephew to eat. Uh, the question is, I, I, I would like to ask Steve Baker to confirm that the Northern Ireland Protocol is a constitutional question rather than an administrative question. Uh, oh, okay. well, yes. Yeah, but, yeah, okay, so, sorry, yes. Do you want Let to me deal with that. Can I do, take... Let me deal with that first. So... I, I think the solution to the set of problems is an administrative one, but you are absolutely right that it is a constitutional issue. Yes, of course it is. I'm sorry that I didn't say that. I, I suppose it's implicit in what I said about the Belfast Agreement. But you're absolutely 100% correct, and I absolutely am happy to confirm it's definitely a constitutional issue. But I think the issue of solving it is about the administrative pr pr approach to things like sausages. But the most difficult, having had to go through all of this in detail, which I'm glad to have done, the most difficult issue to solve around the border is the sanitary and phytosanitary arrangements. In other words, the sausages and sausage rolls and so on. And although it would be tempting to sneer and think this is ridiculous, you can't carry a sausage a couple of miles, the problem is, of course, that food safety is actually quite important when it goes wrong. So we have to have regard to that. But um, dealing with this issue of sausages and sausage rolls and other difficult meat-based products it can be dealt with. Um, but... Dealing with the real administrative problem can't be answered by saying it's a constitutional question, but are you correct that we can't let it go because it's a constitutional question? Yes. So, yes, you are. The, the, the private corporations point, I think it's very, very important. Where was it, sir, you're very, of course you're right. The private corporations have enormous power over us. I've got a bunch of friends who've worked at Facebook, one of whom just quit because he couldn't bear the way Facebook is going. Um, but... There's a book to be written on. I'm sure there's books have been written on this. But where I slightly differ is that although I accept that private corporations, especially big ones, have enormous power, I say that as a, a dedicated Apple user, you know, they've got a lot of influence over how my day goes. But I can always switch to Android, and if they force me, I could. But the thing about the state is it's a territorial monopoly on the use of force, the legitimate use of force, and you can't escape it except by migrating. And anyway, where the hell are you going to go? So, sorry, it's supposed to be a joke, but it's obviously landed flat. <laughs> um, so, the, to Emily, you're my absolute favourite. And um, I think that if James Bond was played by a woman, that would be a different franchise. I would very, very much welcome that franchise. Uh, I think there's absolutely a place for a superstar um, secret agent woman. Of course there is, and I think I'd enjoy the film enormously. Black Widow is called. Um, especially, I'm, fine, I'm yeah. thinking Gal Gadot, actually. Oh, right, OK. But yeah. by the by, um, but, oh, my God, is my wife watching? <laughs> um, but would I... The, the, I've got a confession for you, Emily, about the prospect of me. Two confessions, actually. The first one is I'm really flattered that you might suggest it. <laughs> and secondly, I'm just not ruthless enough. <laughs> No, I think that might be, that may be understated, Mr. Baker. Um, uh, listen, we're clean out of time. Just before I uh, thank Steve, thanks uh, all of you for coming to this uh, packed uh, uh, session of Think Tent. Please do pick up some flyers and some pamphlets off the table. We've got another uh, very busy range of um, events today. Thank you for all of your questions from the floor. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of you. But please join me. Um, it's been a delight to be joined by a politician of integrity and intelligence who is so in favour of individual liberty.
and I think, um, I think Steve, that uh, you can tell from the audience, if you're, if you're not the next James Bond, then at least for Queen and Country, we're going to give you licence to kill unnecessary state interference, wherever you find it. So, Steve, thanks very much thank indeed. Been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.